Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're talking about Postgres over everything, why you should probably just use Postgres for your next web app. Now, I recently read Ethan McHugh's Just Use Postgres, and a lot of it resonated with me from my own experiences building apps and managing data at work and inside project. In this post, I'm gonna focus on a few reasons why Postgres should be your default database for web apps, and some strategies for how I like to use it that balances simplicity and scale. Just use Postgres. So overall, my recommendation is to just use Postgres for most web applications. It's free, it's reliable, and it scales, more so than basically any other competitor. Now, to kind of give you my thoughts on why this is, we're first gonna talk about why use relational and then why use Postgres over other kinds of databases like NoSQL, like Mongo or DynamoDB or even key value stores like Redis or Valky. And then we'll talk about why not use alternative uh, relational databases like MySQL or SQL Server or SQLite and stuff like that. And then finally, um, we'll talk about how I use Postgres to kind of get the best of both. So first off, why use relational databases? So the alternative from relational databases is basically NoSQL. These are gonna be ways that you're usually going to be persisting your core data model for whatever it is you're building at least in you know, web app land. These are gonna be things like document DBs, things like Mongo or Dynamo, there's like a whole bunch of other ones like this, um, or key value stores like Redis or Valky. And of course there's other things like you know, graph databases and you know, the vector databases and stuff. Um, but for the most part, probably 80% I would say are using either DocDBs or key value stores as alternatives to these relationals. Now, a lot of startups and companies created in the past decade have built on document DBs like Mongo because it promised a more straightforward data experience. Just dump your data as JSON and operate it on it there. This works until it doesn't. Now, from the simplicity standpoint, it is very simple to save and read your data. You know, you have it and it's model and memory in your program. And then you can literally just do like um, JSON serialize and persist it. And then on the other side, you can just pull it out and deserialize it. And so it's extremely simple to save and read. Now, the problem with this is that it's so simple um, that it doesn't really have other metadata around it to kind of help you make sure that that thing you're storing um, is actually consistent with what the data model should be. And so it's not very simple to keep this consistent because it really is just a JSON serialized string. And therefore it's not that easy to evolve over time because the database can't necessarily tell you when things are out of sync that need to get updated. Now, scalability wise, you know, NoSQL was pushed a lot because it is very scalable in some regards. And it's very scalable to read and write via primary keys, which is the object ID. And because you can access the object IDs very fast, it's also very easy to horizontally scale this via sharding because we know that you're only gonna access via the primary key, so you don't need to do scans over the whole collection. Um, and therefore we can shard all the IDs to other things and that's how we can horizontally scale very well. Now, the problem with this is that oftentimes you don't want to uh, read via primary key. Like who's gonna have the GUID to, to know exactly what object you're talking about. And you will if you have a direct reference, but oftentimes in business cases, what we're doing instead is finding things that match a specific pattern and then going to operate on those. And so in those regards, it's really not scalable at all to read or write against any other key, like doing a scan or needing to join across documents that maybe share different keys because we got to do an extra lookup every time it's not in the same database um, or to only look at parts of the document because most document DBs you're basically deserializing the entire thing to get out a certain item and therefore if you need to write you need to resave the entire thing because you can't just do um, partial saves and so it is very scalable when you're using it in very specific use cases that it's built for it is not scalable whenever you go off the rails of this and for better or worse, business cases often go off the rails for this because um, it's a little bit more messy than you might have originally thought. Then we go into systemization. So how does this look like you know, in large orgs, systemizing across um, repos, stuff like that. And so it is systemizable in some ways. So ways you can deal with the versioning is just have JSON versioning. So each JSON serialized has the version that it was used at, and then therefore you can have an upgrade path from V1 to V2 and V2 to V3 and stuff like that. Um, for keeping things consistent, you can build your own migrations to, you know, you've updated the data schema, now you gotta go parse all of the, you know, JSON that's saved in your database and upgrade them yourself. Um, and you can also do like in-memory scans and in-memory joins to kind of get the scannability that you already get from relational, but as we talked about, that often is not gonna be the most um, performant thing you could do. And this kind of comes down to why it's not systemizable is that it really is hard to keep everything consistent. Like when you're storing JSON, you don't have all these constraints or keys and stuff. You got to build that stuff yourself. The JSON versions do need to be migratable through the life cycle of your data. So if you're not doing a eager migration, as soon as you change the data model, then you have to keep the V1 to V2, even if you're on V100 forever, as long as there's a V1, you know, in your 
um, database, which kind of gets out of hand pretty fast. Um, and then migrations themselves are often roll your own. This is basically true for any kind of JSON serialization because the database doesn't really know what's in there. Um, so you kind of have to build your own version of, oh, I'm gonna read this thing out, uh, upgrade it myself, and then resave it there. And so in some ways it is all of these things of a simple scalable system, but in many ways it's also not, it has some severe downside. Now I wanna be clear that I'm not saying that Mongo or document DBs can't work, but I am saying that they often bring with them edge case issues that there's not always a great way to resolve. They work quite well when you know what you're doing up front, but the hard part of software is that the requirements keep changing, which means often we don't know exactly what we want at the outset, and even if we do, it's probably going to change over time. Relational databases give us several tools to enforce the most important things about our core data. And in turn, this kind of helps us evolve over time without breaking our stuff, um, which you know, actually accommodates for one of the key things that our systems are gonna need to scale and handle. So the first thing it does is it gives us some more data integrity. If you can't trust your data, what's the point in having it? Things like data schemas, constraints, and relational keys help make sure that the data we're storing makes sense, preventing issues long-term. Like if you think all of your data is nice, but then it turns out that 30% of it is like garbage, then what's the point in even having it? Now more of our relational databases have to tools to handle migrations out of the box, allowing you to plug into these battle-hardened tools versus rolling your own. And most of these migrations can be done in like transactions. So if it fails, it can roll back immediately. It will play with the existing constraints. So if it's going to break, you know, the data integrity as you go, it'll stop you as well. These are just tools that like exist in these relational databases that just can't work so well um, in these document DBs where there's not really any of these kind of integrity checks. So an example of this is like, oh, do you have an existing entity that changed? Maybe like, you know, has a new rule or has a new field or something like that. You can just update the constraints or add a new row or column and then just like handle the migration in here. And we've got all these battle hardened tools um, that help you in these relational. Uh, databases. The next is data flexibility. So whether you like it or not, your data is related. If it wasn't related, it wouldn't be in the same database. Taking this into account and having the ability to enforce relations with constraints and foreign keys improves data integrity, but also allows you to remain flexible and performant as your data continues to change and grow. So if you have a new entity that you want to track, you can just create a table and relate it to existing stuff. This is in comparison to like a document database where often the recommended way to do this is just have one document for an entire customer. This means all the teams and stuff are going to be in in that large a document changing things around, I mean, it quickly gets out of hand because they now you got to do migrations, you got to do um, field updates, uh, you got to make sure that you're all serializing with the correct version, um, all in that same document, which you know at org scale is pretty unlikely. And the next area is performance. So because our data is inherently related, it makes sense that performance on these relations is critical. Document DBs do this well when all the data is in a single document and you can do lookups on their primary key. When it's not, and you need to scan on other fields, it starts to break in almost all business cases. You will eventually need to scan on non-primary key fields for analytics, new features, or new rules. So making a reasonable decision now that works for long-term can protect you from inevitable rework in the future. And the way I can think of this is like, document DBs are great, as like a dictionary or a hash map. If you know exactly the key you want, then they're great for that. The problem is when you need to be iterating over a lot of items to find something that is not that key, they are usually pretty bad at that. And even though they've made like improvements over the years, um, Postgres and relational DBs that are literally built for this just always, always outperform them. And so this helps because as you're adding all these models and stuff um, to the rest of your system, if you have a slow read path or you find out that there's like a new requirement or a new way that you want to use your data, you can just add an index or a view or a query hint to make this um, fast and scale. And again, this helps you with that flexibility where like you don't necessarily know exactly what you're gonna need at the outset because you can't know that. Um, and so as you learn these new features that you need and use cases, you can change your system to still accommodate for those without too much extra effort. And now I've seen these document database scaling issues firsthand at my current company, Rippling. We use Mongo data or DB, but we don't really use it as a document database. There is no one document per customer. There are simply too many models with too many teams involved to make that scalable. Instead, we have a new doc per entity we're tracking, which looks a lot like a relational normalized table structure. What this means is that we get basically none of the benefits of a document database, fast lookups on ID, while all of the down 
downsides. Scans and joins are slow. Joins are often done in memory. Low consistency constraints because it's all just, you know, JSON there. And this also means that when we're like adding new fields or not, we got to deal with like, oh, this stuff's already in the database. We don't have a great way to migrate it. And so there's going to be time in between where like it's nullable and it's huge pain. And then we have to roll our own migrations to kind of deal with this to make sure that the nullables get removed, that we actually do the migration, the data change, um, and add the new constraint. Um, but this is just like a lot of work and it's just not as safe as if we had just used a relational structure. And there's certainly ways around this. And my anecdote data is on small n um, for how MongoDB is like working in many companies. But my guess is that many use cases follow this pattern. And this is confirmed via like, you know, a lot of these Reddit posts where um, everyone's kind of moving from Mongo towards things like Postgres. Now, the downside with these relational approaches is that this extra consistency may require a bit more footwork to set up. You'll often want to update the schema directly yourself, which is an extra step compared to just changing your model and code and saving it. But really, this step is required either way. If you're going document database, you can't just change it in code because you still have existing data on the old code in the database. So you do have to either migrate it all now, so doing like an eager migration to make the data consistent, or build infra to migrate it as you go. This is more of a lazy migration where every time you read a version, you're going to try to update it directly. An extra step either way, just explicit in the relational paradigm. Personally, I find the gains in data integrity, data flexibility, and long-term performance are almost always worth it for the small extra cost in data schema maintenance. You only write sometimes, but you can read quite a lot. So take the extra time to do it right now so you don't have to redo it later. Plus, there are approaches to minimize the extra work required with relational schemas while still getting most of the benefits. We'll touch on these a bit later. Now, the way I like to build my data model is basically have the core data model in Postgres. This gives me a solid core that is reliable, flexible, and performant long-term. And really, I think it's critical to have a core that has good data integrity. And so you want to be storing your you know, business critical data in something like this. And then if I need it, I'll have an auxiliary data model. And this might be in Mongo or Redis or something like that. And this holds extra data often as an external cache. So this provides the improved lookup speed for things that don't need that extra consistency or flexibility since they are not the core. And also these are often things because it's being treated as a cache where you will only be using the cache key. And so this gives you all of the proposed benefits you know, of, of NoSQL and key value stores of their fast lookups and horizontal sharding, um, stuff like that. But you just don't have to use any of the downsides, which is like bad data integrity or scans on you know non-primary keys. You just force it into the things that it's actually good at. All right, so why Postgres versus other relational options like MySQL or SQL Server or Oracle or SQLite? So the reason to use Postgres is that it is reliable, performant, and free. It is the most loved database, it has all the features you might ask for via plugins, regularly ranks in the top five databases for any given task performance-wise, and you don't have to worry about a license that may come and bite you later on. So comparing to other options, first with SQLite. So it's a great little database, but very constrained by scale. It's hard to scale horizontally, which means a single server database works at small scale, but harder to work at large scale. Now, I want to preface this by saying I expect SQLite to continue to improve in the next few years. So this is one to keep an eye on. There's a lot of really cool ideas around SQLite, like having one SQLite database per customer or using SQLite for local storage, um, like on device or having it as like a little cache on inside the server. I think these are all great options. I don't think it's a great option for like your core data model, but I do think it's pretty decent. Um, and we'll continue to improve as well. Okay, the next one is MySQL, which is also a good free option like Postgres, but it falls behind Postgres in reliability, consistency, and performance, and is owned by Oracle with a potentially scary license that could invoke audits and your data being taken hostage. So Postgres is probably just better in most regards. Versus MS SQL or SQL Server, by all accounts, this is a good technology, but it is expensive and proprietary, and in all the benchmarks I've seen, falls behind Postgres. Why not just use Postgres for free and slash your costs and avoid data host. Oracle. Oracle has a terrible track record of performance, reliability, and support. Plus, its database is not very performant. The only reason I see people using Oracle is because the high reps got swindled into a deal and no technical person was involved in the decisions. Don't use Oracle. There are far better options out there. All right, so how I use Postgres databases as a simple, scalable system. So I'm a big fan of Postgres. It's reliable, performant, and free. No other database comes close when you compare the whole pack. Other databases will often be good competitors in a given use case, but Postgres wins out overall and often beats others at their own game. For example, the vector databases that everyone's like hyping up over AI, um, Postgres just put out a simple little plugin and it's already beating many of these vector databases by about 20x. Um, and so I think you should not bet against Postgres. Uh, there's just a really good core there. Um, and I think a lot of people are backing it. And so 
I just think it's a better package overall in almost all cases. Now that said, I think that the general sentiment against relational databases is warranted. They can be a pain to work with if you don't SQL good, and there is a bit of boilerplate involved with translating your code model into SQL, which could slow down dev times. So here I wanna share an approach that I use with Postgres that tries to leverage it for the good parts while avoiding the known downsides of working with SQL. And the system is basically this. Use columns for important metadata that I will constrain or index or scan on. These are gonna be IDs created at, important identifying infos, things that are critical to the data model. They all get their own column because Relational is really good at this for enforcing you know, integrity, flexibility, constraints, um, stuff like that. And then I use a JSONB column for all other properties. JSONB, I think is the a common data format. If not, basically it's just a JSON column. So it is JSON, but it's a specific data type. Um, and it often will give you extra capabilities from the relational standpoint of adding these constraints and indexes and stuff like that. Um, but it is more flexible. I um, mean, the flexibility is what we're using it for here. And so this basically gets the data flexibility, integrity, and consistency benefits of relational, at least on the fields that we care most about that we know are critical to our data model, while still getting the dev benefits of document DBs, not which is like not having to change the schema every single time I add a stupid little field to support a stupid little feature. And then as I build my systems, if a certain property turns out to be more important or more critical than I originally thought, then I will migrate it out from the JSONB into its own column so we can start enforcing its integrity even better, start changing its you know, performance um, and stuff like that from the relational standpoint. This is the core system. Then at hyperscale, we can use those auxiliary databases like document databases, KV stores, um, to handle caching and read layers to remove load from our core DB. These are rarely necessary until high scale and often can be pretty small servicing just a few specific read paths. Um, since we will probably only have a few hot paths, um, we know that we are gonna only use it for what it's good at, which is it's like key lookups. So really just like a cache, you're only gonna add it when necessary, but most of the time you don't actually need it. Now this gives us most of the benefits relational while limiting its downsides, typically giving us a better overall experience than if we reach for just relational or just non-relational. So this is how I currently build my apps. JSON integrity is still a bit of a pain requiring versioning and hand-rolled migrations, but at least I have a bit more flexibility and integrity on the properties that matter most um, while not you know, having these dumb little properties I'm just keeping around get in the way of my dev. Now, if you like this post, you might also like the Hamstack, a simple scalable tech stack for building modern web apps fast and cheap. You might also be interested in a brief comparison of modern programming languages, TypeScript versus Golang versus Elixir versus Rust versus F Sharp. And finally, you might be interested in how to build a full stack web app with F Sharp, um, a guide paved road from going to a no F Sharp experience to a full web app running on F Sharp. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next.